Take your Bibles open to the book of Romans, please. Romans chapter 5. We're going to continue our study in Romans. It's been a while since we've been in here, but we're going to pick up where we left off. And I want you to look in Romans chapter 5 and look down at verse number 10. And I want to talk tonight about a concept that I think is important for all of us as believers to embrace, to understand. And I think it's foundational, really, to understand uh, Romans 5, 6, and 7, this next section that we're going to deal with. Look at Romans 5.12. This is called the the, uh, mystical union of the believer. Romans 5.10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, the next, uh, I would say, 10 verses from verse, actually from verse uh, 10 on on really down to verse 21, uh, these are considered to be some of the most difficult verses in the Bible, let alone uh, in the book of Romans. James Montgomery Boyce, who wrote a four-set commentary on Romans, said this. He said, this is a difficult section of the letter, possibly the most difficult in all the Bible. And so when I read that, I kind of perk up, you know, when someone like that says this is a really difficult section and perhaps the most difficult in the Bible, we really need to try to really understand this. And again, I think in order to understand the next three chapters, we have to understand this concept or the concepts that are going to be given here in chapter 5. We have to understand the concept of the believer's union in Christ. It's essential. Now, let me just remind you where we are in the exposition of this chapter. Um, Remember, uh, how does Romans 5 fit into the whole context of the book of Romans? In chapters 1 through 4, Paul has been dealing with the doctrine of justification. And he clearly shows us what justification is. And we saw that in chapter 4. And then in chapter 5, he begins to list for us the blessings of being justified. And part of Paul's purpose in this was to show us how secure our salvation is. You understand tonight that you're secure in Christ? You understand you can't lose your salvation, which some people teach. And Paul, part of his purpose was, again, to affirm that. Now, some of the Jews who heard this doctrine of justification for the first time were amazed at this doctrine. Some believed it was too good to be true. Um, What did they have to do to keep this? I mean, this salvation that we have it is so wonderful. It is so good. I remember even when I, when I first got saved, I thought salvation is so wonderful. I don't want to do anything that could lose it, you know, because it is so great. And that was the thought of some that, were, that Paul was writing to. Paul wanted them to know that they could not hold on to what they in their own strength could never attain to begin with. And it's also true of us. It's all of grace. It's God who gives it, and it's God who does the keeping. And so you can't lose your salvation. It's made secure by the one who gave you that gift. So how do we know that our salvation is secure? Well, we saw this in chapter 5. We have peace with God, right? Chapter 5, verse 1. We have access and we stand in grace. Chapter 5, verse 1. We have a future hope of glory that upholds us in times of suffering, that hope of glory that we look forward to, that really wouldn't help us if it wasn't something that was sure right? If we could lose that. We have this future hope of glory, and we have been given love and abundance by the Holy Spirit. That Holy Spirit being the the divine agent of love that reminds us constantly about God's love demonstrated in the death of Christ. We have been given assurance that we have been delivered from the wrath to come, and we have joy in God. That's all the things that Paul talks about in the first 10 verses here in Romans chapter 5. All these blessings communicated to the believer to let you know that you are absolutely secure in Christ. And the remainder of Romans doesn't start a new section. Some think that it does. I don't think it does. Paul continues on with the same theme, same idea. And again, Paul's objective here is to help us to understand our security. He wants to enhance our assurance and our security in Christ. And how does one know that they're secure and they won't lose their salvation? Well, Paul's going to communicate another blessing here to tell us that we're completely secure. And as far as I'm concerned, he, uh, he saves the best for last here in 
We're secure in Christ because of our union in Christ. We're secure in Christ because of our union. And so really the question is this, are you in Adam or are you in Christ? Now people say Romans chapter 5 is difficult to understand, and truly it has profound depth to it, profound truth in it. But there's a sense, I think, in which it's also very simple. Uh, simple. And really, the key to understanding Romans 5 is to understand that when God looks at humanity, he only sees two people, really. He sees Adam and he sees Christ. That's what he sees when he looks at humanity. All of humanity is either in Adam or in Christ, one of the two. What's the consequence of being in Adam? Well, in Adam, there's the reign of death. And we see that, look in verse 12, Wherefore, by as one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. Uh, and so it's the reign of death. And look at verse 13, For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression who is the figure of him that was to come. The word similitude is the Greek word tupas. It's where we get our word type. In other words, the first Adam is a type of Christ, the last Adam. That's what he's trying to get at here. And Paul used this comparison before. You remember when he wrote 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he used the same comparison. He compared the first Adam and the last Adam. And he, he made a contrast between those two. The first Adam is from the earth. The last Adam, where we would say Christ, came from heaven. The first Adam was the king of the old creation. The last Adam, king of the new creation. The first Adam was tested in a perfect garden and failed. The last Adam was tested in a wilderness, and he succeeded. The first Adam uh, was disobedient, and in came sin because of him. The last Adam was marked by obedience and righteousness. Death and sin reign with the first Adam. Grace and life reign with the last Adam. In the first Adam, paradise was lost. In the last Adam, Christ, paradise is regained. In the first Adam, the Old Testament ends in a curse. With the last Adam, the New Testament has no more curse. And again, Paul's making it the same kind of contrast right here, and he's saying to everyone, you are either in Adam or you are in Christ, one or the other. When we're justified, we're taken out of our union with Adam, and we're placed in our union with Christ. And this is what theologians call the mystical union of the believer. Uh, th this union has been revealed Although we do not fully comprehend it, we can't fully grasp this. It is, we can't grasp the depth of it, at least I, I can. And it's, it's a glorious reality. However, it's called mystical in that it's hard for us even to fathom. It's hard for us to comprehend. As A.A. A. Hodge, he wrote it like this. He said, it so far transcends all the analogies of earthly relationships and the intimacy of its communion in the transformation, transforming power of its influences, and in the excellence of its consequences. And so this is really a, an incredible thing, a, a, a wonderful spiritual reality that every believer needs to understand, that you have this incredible union with the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, there are three mystical unions that Scripture speak about, right? There's the Trinity. Um, we know the Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We cannot comprehend how God is, is three, and yet he's one. Uh, three persons, uh, fully God, co-equal, and eternal. They're three, and yet they're one. Uh, there's, there's kind of a, a mystery in that, isn't there? I mean, we, we can't fully comprehend that. And then there's the mystical union that is the nature of Christ, we can't fully comprehend how the Lord Jesus Christ is one person, and yet uh, he's fully, truly God and truly man, and those two natures dwell concurrently in one person. There's a union there between those two natures that is hard for us even to comprehend. And that's why the church, the early church, wrestled with this issue 
Um, there was, in, for a time, in the 4th and 5th century, they were grappling with this idea of who Jesus was, and you had the Arian controversy, which was basically a bishop of Alexandria named Arius, who taught that Christ was similar to God, but was not the same as God. Well, of course, that's not what the Bible teaches, and that's a heresy. Um, and this was rejected at the Council of Nicaea and Constantinople. They rejected this. And, and there was one man, really back in that time, a man by the name of Athanasius, who stood for the deity of Christ the way we know it and understand it in the Scripture. And, uh, and that heresy has kind of resurfaced from time to time because people can't understand how these two natures can dwell together in one person. Well, the truth of the matter is, it's beyond really our comprehension. It's beyond us the ability to understand. So there's the mystical union of the Trinity. There's a mystical union of the nature of Christ, the two natures of Christ in one person. And then the third mystical union that the Bible talks about is this union of Christ with the believer. We have a similar situation. We're not really ever fully going to be able to understand the fact that we are united with Christ but it's important for us to understand this as much as we can and to hold on to this truth. And I believe that Paul, he's introducing this idea to us here in chapter 5. And he introduces it really in verse number 10. I want you to look at verse 10 again. It says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved... Notice where it says there, by his life. You might want to underline that, that little phrase there, by his life, that, which is translated this way in the King James Version. It's also translated this way in the English Standard Version. In, uh, in the New International Version, um, it's translated through his life, but that's not the right way to translate it. In the Greek, the preposition is dative, which simply means this. It, can be, it should be translated in his life. We Notice again where it says we, sh we shall be saved in his life. Now you say, is that important? I think it's extremely important. If we said we're saved through or by, this seems to imply Christ's work on the cross, that we're saved uh, through faith in his atonement or by faith in his atonement. By the way, we are. Don't get me wrong, we are. But in verse 10, he's giving a contrast between the death of Christ and the life of Christ. He's giving a contrast. The idea here is his death has already been mentioned. We're saved by his death, but we're also saved in his life. That's the idea there. It's a contrast. We're saved by his death, and we are being saved now in his life. And so the preposition in there is so very important. What does it mean that we're being saved in his life? Now, I think that the rest of chapter 5 is going to explain that, that one thing there. How? We know that we have been saved by his death, but now we are being saved in his life. In what way, Paul? Well, all the rest of chapter 5, he's going to show us that that in Christ now we are united to him, we are in him, and we are being saved in him. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, who again um, preached uh, extensively through the book of Romans. In fact, um, some of you know Martin Lloyd-Jones was the pastor of Westminster Chapel in London, and we were over there last April, and uh, I, I was going to speak there, and um, they still had the parlor there where he would sit and get ready before church, and he would wear a robe while he preached. I'm glad that I don't have to do that here. But in the closet, he still had his robe. His robe was still hanging there. He died in 1981. He had pastored that church since the end of World War II to 1981. There in London, that church is not too far away from Buckingham Palace. And um, also what was interesting to me is there in that parlor is the original pulpit that he preached from, and the Bible, the pulpit Bible, was still there on that pulpit. And when they use a pulpit Bible over there, it's, it's huge. It's big. And, um, and I was interested to know that that pulpit Bible was given to that church by a church here in Baltimore. 
I read that on the, on the outside of the Bible. Very interesting. It was very much faded because it was an old Bible. And when you open it up to the book of Romans, you know what? The pages are falling out. You know why? Because Martin Lloyd-Jones preached, I think, 10 years out of the book of Romans. You think this series here is long. It's going to be maybe a year, maybe. 10 years. And, and some of the pages were falling out, and they were smudged. And a lot of the sermons that he preached are now in an eight-volume commentary on Romans that you can buy. But Martin Lloyd-Jones, when he got here to Romans chapter 5, spent a lot of time here. And Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, the word in, talking about verse number 10, he also believes it's the, uh, we, we should translate it in his life. He said the word in means in the sphere of, or in the realm of, or in connection with his life. That is, when we're saved, we are now placed in Christ, in the realm of Christ, in connection with his life. It is this union with Christ that makes it possible for us to be delivered from death, that's chapter 5, from sin, that's chapter 6, and from the law, that's chapter 7. It is the fact that we're united with Christ that we have victory over death. The fact that we're united with Christ, that's what gives us victory over sin. Don't raise your hand, but how many of you battle with sin in your life? How many of you wrestle and strive against it? You know one of the key things to really help you in this battle against sin is understanding your union with Christ. That's the very thing that Paul's going to bring up in Romans chapter 6 that lets us know how we can have victory over sin. This is the key to understanding that. And so before we launch into the remaining of chapter 5 and then go into chapter 6 and 7, I just wanted to spend some time speaking about this one idea and how important it is that you understand it. And once you see it, I think what you'll find is that you'll see it all over in the New Testament. This, this union that the believer has with Christ, this oneness that we have, I, I see it all over in the New Testament. So let me talk to you about the importance of it. The importance of it. What some theologians had to say, the Scottish pastor and theologian James Stewart called union with Christ the heart of Paul's religion. He added that this more than any other con conception, more than justification, more than sanctification, more than reconciliation, is the key which unlocks the secret of the soul, he says. This was, this was fundamental. John Murray went even farther. He said this, union with Christ is the central truth of the whole doctrine of salvation. This is the central truth right here. A.W. Pink said this, The subject of spiritual union is the most important, the most profound, and yet the most of any that is set forth in sacred scripture. And yet, sad to say, there is hardly any which now is more generally neglected. That's an, that's an incredible thing. This is so important that we understand this concept. Also, I want you to see this is the organizing principle of Paul's theology. Paul appeals to this doctrine as the organizing principle for his entire, we could say, body of theology, his systematic theology. Um, this is the organizing principle for Paul. Um, the first Adam and the last Adam contrast that we see in Romans chapter 5 that depends upon this one idea. In Adam, we possess all that he possesses, original sin, judgment, condemnation, fear, alienation. In Christ, we possess all that he possesses, which is what? His righteousness, holiness, eternal life with the Father, justification, adoption, blessing, and so on. Write this down. Paul uses this phrase, in Christ, 216 times in the New Testament. 216 times we see the phrase, in Christ, in Christ. Every spiritual blessing the believer has comes from being in Christ. Write down Ephesians 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. What? In Christ. We get all these blessings because of this union in Christ. We are new creatures because of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if any man be, what? In Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become 
No. Our salvation flows from it. His grace was given to us before creation, totally apart from anything that we could do. Listen, Second Timothy 1.9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Our completeness in grace flows from it. Colossians 2.10, and ye are complete in him. You're complete in Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. Everything that we need is in Christ. Doesn't that match the song that these girls just sang? Everything, everything. He gives us everything. That's exactly what this tells us. Everything we need for living out our salvation is in Christ. Christ is our sanctification. Christ is our truth. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Christ, there's encouragement, there's comfort, there's fellowship, there's compassion, there's faith, there's love. Our spiritual gifts are considered enrichment in Christ that all flows from him. And by the way, everything that we do, we should do it in Christ. It should be done in Christ. What do you think it means when, it's, when Paul says, whatever he does, he does it in Christ? It means that he does it in the power of Christ, not of himself, in Christ's power. He does it for the honor of Christ. Everything we do, we should do in Christ. That's what Paul says. Read through his letters and see how many times he says this. He speaks the truth in Christ. He's proud of his work in Christ. He reminds the Christians of his ways in Christ. He hopes in Christ. He plans in Christ. He rejoices in the Lord. He exhorts Christians in the name of the Lord. He says, I can do all things through what? Christ, which strengthens me. He labors in Christ. He rejoices in Christ. He tells us to be strong in Christ or be strong in the Lord. And on we could go all through the letters that Paul writes. All of the blessings pertaining to our hope for, for, for the future are in Christ. That's why we can have hope when we're facing death. We die in the Lord. We die in Christ. We will be resurrected in Christ. And when he returns, we will be revealed with him in glory because we're so connected with him that it's almost like I'm already there. What does the Bible say in Colossians? We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. You say, no, wait a minute. I'm seated right here at Grace Bible Baptist Church on Sunday night. Yeah, I know. I see you. But guess what? If you're a Christian, you're also seated in heavenly places. So I can't see that. You don't have to. That's why it's mystical, the mystical union of the believer. In God's mind, you're in heaven. You're seated here, but you're also seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's why, you know, one person said, I, you know, I hope you're going to make it to heaven. I said, well, it's up to you because I'm already there. I'm already seated there. And you are too. You're so one with him that whatever happens to Christ, wherever he is, that's where you are. And what happened to Jesus on the cross? You were there. You were in him. That's what Paul means when he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. He just kind of goes back and forth. It's Christ, but I'm there with him. It's him doing it, but I'm doing it, but yet I'm in him. I'm so united with him. I'm so much one with him that when Jesus died, I died. When Jesus was buried, I was buried there with him. When Jesus rose, I rose with him. And Jesus is now seated in heavenly places. And guess what? That's where I am too. Wherever he is, I am. Because we are so one. You remember on Wednesday night we were studying Hebrews where it says, He who sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all what? They're one. Same idea. Those who are being saved, that's us. And the one who saves, that's Christ. We're one. Same concept. We are united. We are one. And when Christ comes back and he's glorified, we will share in that glory. We are heirs with God and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's, it's, again, it's incredibly important that we understand that. 
And again, that's why I say, you know, I, I talk to people all the time who, you know, some believe this doctrine that you can lose your salvation. That's someone who just does not at all understand their union in Christ. If you believe that you can lose your salvation, you can fall away, you just totally don't understand what salvation is. You don't understand that you are united to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason you're not going to lose your salvation is because he's not going to fall away and you're tied to him. You're so one with him. And so another thing about this this mystical union is that it offers equal attention to the subjective nature of salvation. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, there's a lot of emphasis today on the objective nature of our salvation. That is, what it, what it means is the outward legal actions of God towards us in salvation. We have been declared righteous. We have been reconciled to God. We have been adopted into the family of God. All of these things are outward legal forensic works or actions regarding our salvation. Those are all objective things. That's the objective side. But our union in Christ emphasizes this subjective side. It's a salvation that I sense because what do we have living in us? We have the, the Holy Spirit in us who reveals Christ to us. And we experience the presence of Christ in us. We, we kind of sense this union, this oneness through the Holy Spirit who unites us to Christ. And you know what we have? This is, a, this is a mark of a true believer. We have this longing in us to have fellowship with Jesus, don't we? To enjoy this, this fellowship, this relationship that we have in Lord Jesus. And so this mystical union really is an emphasis on the subjective nature of salvation that we experience Christ. We experience the power and work of the Holy Spirit from within. So we see the importance of this union. But let me talk to you about the identification of this union. And I am not going to finish this sermon, but I'm going to do my best. Um, what it's not. Again, when people try to explain the Trinity, they seek to use analogies, and those normally fall short. And I think that happens sometimes when people try to explain this union that we have with Christ. It kind of falls short. It's not merely a moral union of love and sympathy. For example, in the Old Testament, there's a friendship between Jonathan and David. And you remember what the Bible says about them, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and he loved him as his own soul. And sometimes people will point to that to say, that's kind of what our union in Christ is like. And, and that's okay, but the problem is, is that that's not enough. It falls short. of that, that, that friendship that Jonathan and David have, your union with Christ is is to a much greater degree. That model is a little too weak. Your closeness and union with Jesus is so much more in depth, so much more intimate. Write down this verse, John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said unto him, listen to this, if a man will love me, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and listen to this, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him, and we will make our abode with him. Now think about that. By the way, the word abode there, um, meno, uh, the word that's used in John 14 about mansions where God says, um, you know, in my father's house are many mansions, many abiding places, many dwelling places. And here the same word is used. If any man love me, he'll keep my words. My father will love him and we will come and we will make our dwelling place in him. That's just an incredible thing there that God the Father and Christ would come and they would dwell with us. So again, and there's much more that we could say. This is, this, is, uh, this is not a union of essence, which is so deep and absorbing that it destroys the distinctiveness of our personalities. We still are who we are, and yet we are united with Christ. It's not a oneness game, game by sacraments, you know, um, a lot of people teach that through the Lord's Supper and baptism. They only reveal uh, it's uh, what that union is like. They only kind of point to that union, but they don't make that union. Does that make sense to you? Let me, let me just say this. When a person is baptized, that baptism is a symbol of a spiritual reality that is true in your life. When you go under the water of baptism, that's a symbol that says, when Christ died, I died. I was there with him. 
and I died. And when Christ was buried, I was buried. And when Christ rose, I arose with him. And so it's a symbol of a spiritual reality that exists between you and Jesus. And so what is it? It is judicial. From a legal aspect, God pronounces this true in our life. It is spiritual. This union is a spiritual union. The Bible says we are immersed spiritually. We are baptized into Christ so that when you're saved, you're taken out of Adam and you are baptized into Christ. Let me just show you this one passage and, um, and we'll be done. I'll let you go. Um, I know you feel like you're in my seminary class right now. Look, look at 1 Peter real quick. 1 Peter chapter 3. Let me just show you this. 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 20. 1 Peter 3.20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now here Peter is uh, speaking here. And Peter's pointing to the event that happened when Noah and his family got into the ark. He's actually talking about the, fu- the fact that when Christ died, he went and preached into the spirits that were in prison. During his three days, he went and p- preached to the spirits in prison. And these spirits were in prison because they were disobedient when? In the days of Noah. And then this is what he says about the days of Noah. That while the ark was preparing, were in few that his eight souls were saved by water. And someone reads that verse and they say, "Uh aha, there you are. You're saved by water baptism. It says you're saved by water. And there are a lot of people who believe in baptismal regeneration that will point to this verse and say, it's water baptism that saves you. The problem is that's just not true. Because the, the preposition by water, the Greek preposition is actually through. So we can say it like this. You're saved, they were saved through water. They were saved through the water. What was the water? It was the water that was the judgment. It was the water that God poured out, the rain, that God was using to judge the earth. And they were saved because why were they saved? Not because they were baptized in that water. They didn't want to be in that water if you were Noah back then. Where were they? They were in the ark. And the ark was saved through the water, you see. Water didn't save Noah. It would have killed him if he wasn't in the ark. So what's the idea here? It was baptism that saved him, but it wasn't water baptism. You say, what what do you mean? The word baptism simply means immersion, to be placed into fully. Uh, That's the Greek word baptizo. When in the Greek, um, classical Greek literature, when a ship sank to the bottom of the ocean, they would use the word baptizo. When a woman was dying clothes and she put the clothes completely underneath the water or the dye, she would say the word baptizo. And it doesn't always refer to water. It's being plunged into something completely. It's being immersed into something completely. In fact, Jesus used this word when he talked about To the disciples, he said, are you going to be able to be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? What was he talking about there? Suffering. Are you able to be plunged into the suffering that I'm going to be plunged into? I'm going to be fully immersed in suffering. And so what baptism saved them then? It was the baptism of being placed in that ark. You see, Noah and his family were fully immersed inside that ark. They were baptized in that ark, and while they were inside that ark, they were saved through the water. And so baptism did save them, but it wasn't water baptism. It was being baptized. It was being placed in that ark. And you know what Peter says? He says, this ark, look at verse 21, the like figure, that is, it is anti-tupos is the word. It is a, a, a type of salvation. You see, this is what happened. When you got saved, you know what? God immersed you in Christ. Just like Noah and his family were placed inside that ark, and now they were saved from judgment, 
when you got saved, God immersed you into Christ and you're fully baptized into him. And that's part of this union. You're now one with him. And because of this oneness, because you're baptized into Christ, you're safe from judgment, just like Noah and his family were safe from judgment. You're now safe from judgment. And just like Noah and his family went through that whole storm and later that ark was resting high on Mount Ararat, uh, high and exalted, there's going to come a time when we will be exalted, we will be seated with Christ in heavenly places. And so really, the ark is a picture of salvation where we are placed inside of Christ. By the way, did you know, I think this is true, I think the ark had the dimensions of an ancient coffin, only it was on a huge scale. And so if you were back in Noah's day and you saw this ark built, you would look at it and you would think, this is a giant coffin here. It was just designed to float. That's it. And there's a sense in which when you come to Christ, you know what happened. By the way, when Noah got in that ark, he died to his old life. And when he got on that ark, he was baptized into that ark. And then when he got off the ark, he resurrected to a new life. There's a sense in which when we are saved, we are placed in Christ. You know what happens? We die to our old life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, right? And so we're completely new. And that's a beautiful illustration, I think, of the idea of being placed in Christ. And when you're baptized, it is a symbol of a spiritual reality that you have been placed in Christ, you're one with Christ, and all the blessings that we have are because of this wonderful union. And this is how we continue on in his grace, because we are connected to him. We are united with him. And what are some of the illustrations of this? And I don't have time to go over all these, but what did Jesus say? I'm the vine and you're the what? Branches. There's that oneness. The branch can't do anything of itself. He has to be united to, that branch has to be united to the vine. There's the stones in a building. Each stone is individual, yet it's part of that one building. We're members in the body of Christ. There's the bride and the bridegroom. That oneness there is reflected in salvation, the same oneness that we have in Christ. And again, I think this, the key to, when we understand this, this is the key to living a victorious Christian life. This is the key to living above sin, which is constantly trying to pull us down. We are united in Christ. We have all this power and blessing because of our union with Jesus. It is a life-giving union that we have. It is spiritual, this union. Um, it is vital because it gives us life. It is mystical, again, and that is really incomprehensible for us. And it is inseparable because what did Paul say? Nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ. We're constantly united to our Lord Jesus. Let, let's have a word of prayer together tonight. Lord, I pray that we will understand this beautiful concept of our union with our Savior. And Lord, this is the key for us to really having the victory that you want us to have, to having the power, the life, the victory. Because we know that in and of ourselves we can do nothing just as a branch can do nothing without the vine. Even so, Lord, we can do nothing without you. Everything we do, we do in our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Lord, help us to comprehend this, this beautiful oneness that we have. And let this guide us. Let this encourage us. May we be reminded that it is Christ in you that is the hope of glory. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful truth. May it help us in our daily walk to know that we are inseparably linked with our Savior in all that we do. Father, impress this upon our heart, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.